I'm pleased to have such a thoughtful, experienced group on this City Talk topic. So many topics at the moment that are so difficult for us to all be wrestling with in tandem at the same time. We've got war breaking out all over the place. It's very conflicting. It's causing all sorts of challenges, both uh, in Europe and in the Middle East, where it's most acute, but also here amongst our neighbors and in our own communities. And I appreciate this is a time of great anxiety and pain for people. So just to acknowledge that in a somber kind of thoughtful way and to recognize that we need to work together to figure out what our collective life is going to be and it needs to be now and what it needs to be in the future. Uh, and that's the the heart of this topic that we've chosen today around the manifestation, what are what encampments and, and the sort of uh, struggles that the shelter systems are experiencing as part of a homeless uh, continuum. What what can what what can we be collectively working on? What's working? What's not? What's next? Those are the three questions we always ask at CUI. Uh, I happen to be in Toronto today, although I've been resident in Ottawa for the last several weeks. Where it's really cold. Just to highlight, if anybody wonders about this, the nation's capital is a very experiences winter in its own unique way. Uh, and I've been appreciative to have my time there, but this week I'm back in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Credit, the Anishinaabe, Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Uh, and in this particular case, treaties that were signed, Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaty. Um, we at CUI uh, have listeners and participants from all across the country and in, across North America, actually. And I think that many of you are signing in. I appreciate you doing that and identifying where you're signing in from, uh, which are traditional territories of a, of a myriad of First Nations. And we are all collectively, as we are with this topic, we are collectively trying to determine what reconciliation needs to look like and what, what the truth is uh, of the ways in which Indigenous peoples have been affected by urbanism, uh, bad urbanism, and the uh, limitations of urbanism. And here's a topic that de demonstrates that very significantly because we have an overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in the homeless population. So um, here we are. Uh, we've had, I think, over 200 city talks since uh, about four years ago when we started them early in the pandemic. They're on the website, citytalkcanada.ca. They continue to be downloaded and referenced, and they they have a remarkable shelf life. Uh, there's about 400 different people that have actually appeared on a city talk, and then thousands who have signed in as you all are. Um, and it's a really interesting uh, repository of collective problem solving and trying to inform public policy from the ground up. So I encourage you in your spare moments, if you're like me, Saturday night scrolling, you know, have a look at a city talk, have a listen. You're going to hear some really, really thoughtful uh, uh, observations and recommendations around what's working, what's not, and what's next. And it's particularly poignant because it was all initiated during the pandemic. So here we are. This is an important, critical topic. It's kind of a proxy, I think, for urban systems that are not aligned and are not functioning in the way that we need them to. And here we are in a state of crisis across the country and made all the worse by uh, uh, fierce weather and uh, putting pressure on uh, orders of government, on civil society, on not-for-profits, on communities uh, in the support uh, situation, but just putting enormous pressure on people, families, individuals, working people, people who have other support needs. So it's a really important topic. I'm going to ask my um, esteemed group to put their cameras on, and we're going to hear from coast to coast pretty much uh, what people are seeing. And uh, I, I never want to you know, the interesting thing about City Talk that I always say at the end is, if I forget to, somebody remind me, I always say, it's not the end of a conversation, it's just the beginning, you know? Urbanism and making great cities is a constant iterative work in progress. It's never over. And so the fact that we've probably had half a dozen, maybe more, I haven't counted them, but we've certainly had many sessions that have talked about encampments and the phenomenon. And I don't know, I think Leilani, you may have been on the first one, I'm trying to remember, but, and a number of people at that time thought it was a bit of a temporary thing. Do you remember? We all thought it was just gonna, oh, it's a stop gap. It's, it's a response to the pandemic, it'll settle down. Well, here we are. And uh, four years later, and the encampments are much longer, are, have been around much longer than that. But in the same way that food banks, I'm old enough to remember when food banks were first introduced, and people thought, again, this was going to be a temporary thing. It was churches, and everybody remembers this. And I was in university, and we thought it was a temporary thing. And I remember there were naysayers saying, uh, if you start that, you'll never, ever, you'll never be able to eliminate them. And so here we are at this inflection point where we've got significant conflicts about what to do 
with this predicament that we see ourselves in as city builders and that thousands of families are experiencing and individuals. So I'm going to ask our folks to give us their unvarnished, as we know, this is supposed to be a safe place as much as we can make it to be, um, where we have really frank conversations about what's working, what's not, and what's next. And I would encourage people in the chat, as you always do, the chat it always is alive at CUI uh, on these city talks. It has a whole life of its own. So please don't hold back throw in your comments there. Let's be respectful. Let's remember that this is a difficult topic for lots and lots of people and lots of people have very personal experiences with it. Uh, but also resources, questions, feel free to put them there. We will, when uh, if people refer to studies or resources, CUI staff will smack them into the chat. And as you know, the chat will get published as the recording also gets published. So uh, I really appreciate you all being with us. And I'm going to ask Jamie to go first, if you could, uh, to just give us a, a bit of a picture. You've put Regina as your affiliation. I know that you uh, you know work in a bunch of different places, but tell us a little bit about who you are and what your particular perspective is. And then just in brief, you know what's working, what's not, and what do you think needs to be next? And we'll go around the table and then we'll get together and have a, have a group chat. So over to you, Jamie, welcome to City Talk. Thanks, Mary, I appreciate it. Uh, so my name is Jamie Gons, and I am from the Pasca First Nation in Treaty 4 territory in Saskatchewan. Um, I've worked in housing, uh, supporting those in, um, in marginalized communities, experiencing um, residential school trauma, uh, supporting families, and understanding and trying to bring light to barriers that Indigenous people face on a daily basis. Uh, inside of their families, inside of their generations, and really help Canadians as a whole understand how do we make lives better for everyone that lives in this great country. And it's a really difficult conversation because many Canadians are very divided on how they see Indigenous people and the issues that they face. Um, for me, I think what impacted me the most when it comes to encampments is I was directly on the ground in Pepsi Park in Regina when that encampment began. And I think some of the most profound things that I've seen were the community, the supports, the connection that individuals came to um, become inside of that encampment. And when that encampment started, it was actually by one individual. It was one person that had nowhere to go. They were scared, they were alone, they had no supports. And so they reached out to a community member and that community member said well all I can do is maybe buy you a tent and give you a little bit of support and hopefully we can figure something out from there and that community grew to I think we had just under 150 residents inside of that encampment in Regina it was you know for as beautiful as an encampment can be it was quite incredible the people that were there that were supportive the community came out big corporations like enbridge supported by giving um, warming packs and food and we had the fire department come out and support and provide fire safety and warmth and they had um, church groups and just community members as a as a whole come out and support these people but the one thing that we learned out of this was it was just temporary. There were no supports or services or connections to services that provided these people a way out. And I think that's where we fell short. That's where we failed. We didn't provide these individuals, these brothers, these sisters of ours, an opportunity at safe, adequate, and affordable housing and the wraparound services that they need to become thriving parts of our community. And I think if we look back and we look at the lessons learned, I think that would be the most important takeaway from all of it, is that while we helped them stay warm and fed them, we didn't provide them a way out, we didn't provide them the supports and we didn't support them the way they needed to. So we failed them 100%. And I think the most heartbreaking moment I've ever seen in my career is when the bulldozers came in and tore that camp apart like these people were not people. Everything that they received, all of the love from the communities they received, they were told, you have two hours, collect your two garbage bags because that's all you can take with you to the shelters or the apartments you're going to, and the rest is garbage. How can you tell a human being that the love they received from another human being is garbage? Because it can't fit, ironically, 
in a garbage bag. This is our failure and we need to own it and we need to learn from it and we need to do better because these are our brothers and sisters, regardless of our skin, skin color, we need to do better. So I appreciate having, uh, having my voice on this today and uh, I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much, Mary. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. I mean, there is a flagrancy to the way that these things have been been visibly, and the media, of course, doesn't help, but, but I hear you, it becomes a kind of visceral shock when people watch the way, and we had uh, ages ago at the very beginning, I don't know if in 20, I think someone will remember, and maybe one of the staff can put up some of the other city talks that deal with this, but we had Tracy Cook on, who was the deputy city manager in Toronto, who got involved in that clearance um, at um, Trinity Bellwoods, I think. And again, it was, that's what shocks people is that it's it seems to be so callous. Uh, but as you're suggesting, the, the callousness is actually being demonstrated all along with the absence of supports and the our inability to actually catch people and provide the supports long before they get into an encampment, find themselves in an encampment, yeah. Okay, Sandra, can we hear from you in, uh, I bet it's sunny in Calgary. It seems always to be sunny. Is it sunny? Uh, it's actually quite cloudy today, Mary. Oh, uh, gosh, it's a miracle. When my, our, one, of our, one of our senior colleagues lives in Calgary. He always puts his camera up and goes, nah, 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 we have sun again. Um, so <laughs> talk to us about uh, Calgary's got a particular set of experiences and context, and you're right in the thick of it. So tell us tell us from your, your side. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Sandra Clarkson. I'm the CEO of the Calgary Drop-In Centre, which is a large uh, homeless shelter, uh, housing-focused emergency shelter. Um that operates in Calgary. We have capacity for up to a thousand people. Uh, never a good thing to have a thousand people uh, mm -hmm. in the same building at one time. Um, but I think, you know, our direct experience with encampments uh, that I want to share is that we had a significant encampment that uh, uh, built up outside of our facility in 2022. And it became incredibly dangerous. Uh, it was it was ultimately was run by organized crime. Uh, there was a lot of violent incidents, sexual assaults, human trafficking, uh, drug trafficking, uh, significant amounts of exploitation, um, threats on staff, threats on uh, others uh, seeking the services of the Calgary Drop-In Center. And we knew that we couldn't allow that to continue just for safety purposes alone, but we knew enforcement alone was not the way to go. So um, we worked very closely and collaboratively with uh, numerous different departments within the city, including bylaw, fire, police, uh, emergency services, local outreach groups, other service providers, and uh, a very well-coordinated uh, communication strategy as well as uh, operation strategy. And we really went in with social services first uh, and enforcement last. Yeah. So uh, as Jamie spoke about the connection to services, that is a critical component. And uh, you know, our, our uh, actions that day were known as Operation East Side and we also, at the same time, you know, went in with with social services first, led with that, and uh, in the the weeks leading up to it, we had made a very concerted efforts to get to know who was actually out there, what are their needs, how can we support them in finding safe and appropriate housing, uh, which we believe is was not in a tent um, that was really uh, governed by organized crime, and. Um, so we set up a resource center. There were there were some individuals, uh, admittedly, that were living in that encampment that had been uh, restricted access to services due to safety uh, issues or incidents of violence within the shelter. Um, but we didn't that didn't preclude us from working with them um, in a different way. So we set up a resource center that had numerous different uh, community partners on sites where we could do taxes, ID clinics, health services, uh, counseling, um, and mainly housing uh, specialists in order to get people connected to housing. In fact, the day we did that, we did apartment viewings with people that same day uh, and knowing that housing was the answer and 
um, we were able to house 28 people directly from that encampment that day. And so uh, the services are an absolute key, uh, but we also recognize that, um, you know, encampments uh, have the potential to be very unsafe uh, for those living in them as well as the surrounding uh, community. You know, um, uh, before the movie Oppenheimer came out, the most famous Oppenheimer was Oppenheimer Park in Vancouver. And uh, Donnie Rosa, who used to be the general the general manager of the park system, I don't know whether Donnie's on, or if there's anybody else who's on from Vancouver to let us know whether you've got data about when you rehoused people out of the Oppenheimer uh, encampment, which was a huge encampment. I don't know if you know that, Sandra. It was several hundred during yeah. the pandemic, right? I don't know whether we do... we. Sadly, we've been at this long enough that we probably do have the capacity to get some data to find out when people get rehoused, does it stick? Mm -hmm. um, and and that was an elaborate process that we heard about in real time. So Donnie, if you're on, maybe you can put something in or somebody else who's familiar with the Vancouver uh, situation and whether it got resolved. And if there's any data to tell us how that worked. Sandra, when you go back to, um, you know, I think one of the dilemmas that people respond to is who's to who is best equipped to make the decision about whether it's safe. Uh, you know, that's one of the challenges, right? So there's a I think there's a concern maybe that encampments are deemed unsafe by people who who are influenced, let's say, by neighbors or by some other set of values, and and may not appreciate that the person in the camp. There are some people in encampments who are choosing that mm -hmm. because they feel safer there then they feel in a shelter, right? Yeah, so how do, you, how do you square that? That Tim, I'm going to come to you next because you've got the big picture and then a stare and then Leilani. Go ahead, Sandra. And how do you square that? And maybe, I don't know whether Jamie wants to come back in and comment go further, but go ahead, Sandra. I mean, it's a great question and I wish there was an easy answer to it. Um, I think, you know, in our particular case, uh, we, we had a lot of video uh, evidence to indicate it was unsafe. Uh, staff were being threatened on a daily basis. We knew right. people were afraid to walk through the encampment because it was right outside of our front doors. Uh, yeah. We're afraid to walk through the encampment to access the services so that they could end their experience of homelessness. Uh, and we you mean, knew you mean had... people who people who were in the encampment did not feel safe in the encampment. Is that what you're suggesting? Some of them were actually held there against their will. Uh, okay. And other other individuals that would be seeking the services that the drop in center offers in order to end their experience of homelessness were yeah. afraid to come in because they kind of literally had to walk the gauntlet uh, yeah. through the encampment to access the building. And so that's. I mean, speaking specifically to our direct experience, that was that was a big part of it. Yeah, and I Tim, ended up going. Sorry, I just ended up going to the the police uh, with some of our video footage, and I said, "We this cannot continue. It was so dangerous." Mm -hmm. it, you know, again, it's and this is part of a larger systemic set of failures we've got. We work a lot with business improvement areas all across the country on the states of main streets and downtowns, and. Those, those stewards, their place stewards, they're reporting all sorts of criminal activity, unsafe activity, uns all sorts of uh, difficulties. And they end up having to involve the cops and then the cops often will stop responding and then business owners end up having to get involved. And it's, we're in this sort of gray, gray space repeatedly about where is help coming from and how do we balance the needs for community safety and and also resident choice that's making that something's making the uh, chat blow up thank you everybody keep going in there can i just caution people on the chat i see people putting in various things you know the chat is not your own bulletin board to promote your own stuff particularly uh, if we could just uh, have encourage you to post stuff about that's relevant to this conversation that would help us um tim so your big picture on homelessness so mm -hmm. um, tell me how, when did encampments become part of this continuum? And what is your perspective on on where we're at now in the spring of 2024? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think uh, unsheltered homelessness and encampments have been a fact of life in Canada for some time. We haven't seen them on the scale. We see them now mm -hmm. um, for, for, well, I don't think we ever have seen them quite on the scale. We've, we see them now. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of approaching this from a place of hope and worry. Okay. Uh, I, I'm approaching it from hope because I, I 
you know, I've seen, like in the example Sandra gave, that there's a there's a way to resolve encampments that make sure people can access the right to housing quickly um, mm -hmm. and respects their uh, self-determination, right? Um, but my worry is the scale of the problem that we see today and the binary that this conversation I fear is falling into. You know, homelessness on the scale we see today is larger than the scale of unhousing from Canada's largest natural disasters. Yep. Right. So again, many of you will have heard me say this before. In Calgary in 2013, in our flood, um, we had 77,000 households were dislocated. Right. Mm -hmm. None of them are still homeless today. None of them, except those that were at the drop-in center when the drop-in center was evacuated, and some may may still be. But why is it that in Canada? we can resolve the homelessness of people who become homeless from natural disaster, but we can't or won't for people who are living in encampments or experiencing homelessness due to poverty or policy. What does so that I tell you? I mean, is, is mental illness part of it too, though, or are needing more mental health supports? Well, homelessness because people have been, no. because people are chronically disadvantaged? I think it's a choice. I think it's a policy choice. I think you know, homelessness is a housing problem. It's not caused by mental illness or addiction. It happens more often to people with mental illness or addiction, more often to people who are indigenous, right? But it doesn't happen because of just because of mental illness or addiction. But you know, I, I think that where I where I have a worry is that I'm I'm concerned, especially in the public narrative, that this conversation is going into this kind of false binary between police enforcement, which is cruel and ineffective and violent, and it just doesn't work, or allowing encampments to remain, right? right. And I think I, my hope is that we can be focused on rapid resolution of encampments. And you, you made a really important point when you said some people are choosing encampments. I want to just talk about choice really quickly because I think the key to resolving encampments effectively is is having is thinking about it in terms of choice. People are choosing encampments because they either have no other alternatives or the other alternatives are worse, right? So the key to resolving an encampment, I think, is having a conversation with people in those encampments as individuals, one at a time slowly and methodically, understanding their needs, understanding what they want, and then providing them with a better option, right? That's the key to resolving encampments, and it doesn't need to wait, right? Now, th if this we is have a better option, but we can create those better options. This is the thing. So Sandra, in, in a rental housing market that is sub 1%, 1% or maybe 1.5, Sandra found housing for 28 people right away, right? You look at Niganon in Edmonton, which is, uh, you know, an Indigenous organization set up low barrier, uh, effectively shelter for, well, not shelter, um, bridge housing for Indigenous people using basically workforce housing. Like there are rapidly deployable options that we can create if we choose to do so. But if we get trapped in this binary, and it becomes this culture war street fight, we get nowhere. So what I'm hoping you know, we do, and, and we're gonna do some work on this, is give cities examples and give them tools and give them models and just say, you know, try to do you know, what Sandra did at the drop-in center, try to do what Fort McMurray has recently done. Look to what Houston has done. Look at the Niganon project in Edmonton as a way of creating rapid housing. Look at what St. Thomas Elgin is doing in terms of proactive outreach to people who are becoming street involved so that they don't form encampments and you can rapidly respond to them. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, um, what you're suggesting about some, there are some alternative approaches that are proving to be effective. So I think uh, the ones you've decided, it'd be great, Tim, if you've got a minute, if you can snack down the names of them in the chat and then COI can see if there's documentation they could make live on that. Also, when you say choice, I want to just clarify, because I know we're always careful about this. I always say cities are about choice, maximum choices of all sorts. You're not talking about um, individuals choosing 
particularly. What you're saying is we have an absence of, of you, actually, I think you're referring to policy choices. Well, I'm, I'm, public I'm, I'm, policy I'm, use, I'm using it in a few different ways. Okay. Like, there is a there is a structural systemic policy choice we're making to either ignore the housing issue, not resolve it, or mm -hmm. allow this homelessness to continue. There are, right. Right, when you're talking specifically about encampments, we're talking about individual, rational, individual choices to make their lives better, to stay alive, right? This is, you know, encampments are really a survival mechanism. Yeah. Um, I see interesting comments in the chat from colleagues like Kathy Crow and Carolyn Weitzman. Um, gals, if you know of specific data sets that exist, so the 150 that were in Tent City, Kathy, do we actually, I saw the book you cited, but do we actually have data that is, I don't know whether we have any longitudinal data to see that when people are provided the support, do they stay? And I don't know, it's interesting for me to know whether we have those. Okay, we still have a couple of people to hear from, Esther and then Leilani. Um, Esther, I think you're going to take a, a sort of broad view. Uh, you study this and look at it in a bunch of different contexts. So give us your sense of what you're observing in terms of what's working and what's not. Sure. Yeah, I have mostly been looking at this at a kind of broader scale, um, although, you know, lots of attention to specific um, happenings, especially in, in Toronto. Um, and, you know, I think our starting point really has to be that in, encampments are a violation of human rights, um, but we can't compound that violation with further breaches of human rights. So our approach has to start from what is human rights compliant. And yeah. the approaches we see for the most part really aren't human rights compliant and they're not working. So they're not stopping encampments from forming and they're violating human rights. And both of those should be non-starters, right? If we're not fixing the problem, we need to find a different approach. If we're violating human rights, we need to find a different approach. So, you know, in particular, I just really think we need to emphasize the end of forced evictions. They do not work. They are violent and they violate a whole set of human rights. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean that anyone thinks encampments are a permanent solution or a solution at all. It just means we're not gonna choose to address the violence of our collective human rights failure around the right to housing with further violence, right? Mm -hmm. It means we need to figure out what the alternatives that are human rights compliant are. And I would just touch back on the kind of safety issue around, you know, defining what safety and who's defining that. I mean, safety and risk have been long used to displace people from their territories, from housing of all different kinds, particularly people who are precariously housed. So we need to be really, really careful about what we mean and who's defining safety. And we need to start with listening to the people who are living in encampments and respecting their expertise. So this is how we're going to find lasting solutions, and it's how we're going to find equitable solutions, particularly solutions that are suitable for specific local contexts. And I really want to applaud the advocates report for using this as a starting point by going to speak to people around the country and hear from their experiences and drawing on those to set some guidelines um, and targets for policymakers who are trying to grapple with this admittedly really difficult issue. So the report makes clear that we can recognize encampments aren't a solution and ensure those living in them are treated with dignity and respect. So we can do those things at the same time, it is possible. And you know, some of the things that, that are in there are really, not emphasize or emphasizing, sorry, that shelters are an interim solution and we need to get better at doing them, but they're not housing. Housing has to include all the elements that are called for in international law around security of tenure, affordability, accessibility, cultural appropriateness, the provision of services. And there are really specific things that municipalities can bring to the table in terms of that. And the starting point for that is really embedding human rights right into the policy frameworks that we're using to approach these issues. And those policy frameworks 
in order to be human rights based have to be co-developed. So not, you know, consultation where we go out and say, hey, this is the approach we're going to use. And we've already determined what that is, but actually taking the time to meaningfully create processes that are about co-development with people with lived experience. And this, mm -hmm. I think, really needs to um, emphasize Indigenous jurisdiction and mm -hmm. Indigenous organizations as leaders in this area. There's amazing work being done on the ground, but we need to build it into our legal frameworks and our policy frameworks that these solutions are what we're going to focus on and we're going to respect that jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel with so many things in urban life, we have to hold, we have to work at various scales at the same time. So you're the, and I, uh, Leila, it's a nice feed in for you in terms of human rights, obviously, because I know that's your focus the, that Esther has just, Esther has just pointed to, but the, there's the, we need these things embedded in policy. Those of us that live in that world know how long that takes. So embedding in policy is like, you know, I, I used to never have any gray hair. Now look at me. Like it's a long, arduous process. And in the meantime, you've got really very contentious situations happening in in um communities of all scales and all sizes so um leilani i know you worked on a i can't you're going to tell us what it was called again there was a working group on encampments and you were working very directly with municipal practitioners mayors and people on the ground uh, to come up with a protocol which i'm assuming is some kind of an interim step to the world that Astaire is saying we should have which is that human rights compliance is fed through the whole system, right? So give us your perspective. And I know you look at jurisdictions around the world as well as your home in Canada. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to all the speakers before me. So many really important and valid points that I agree I agree with so much of what's been said, obviously. Um, I guess where I wanted to start, Mary, if, if this is okay, and you're gonna kind of hate it because it's super zoomed out and not practical, but I'll get to the practical. That's fine. But, you know, I think in some ways encampments in Canada are really actually natural and predictable. Um, and I hate to say that, but I think like when I ask myself, like, what did we think a uh, settler, colonial, neoliberal state that promotes rent seeking and profiteering on stolen land by white settler colonialists? What did we think that would look like? Well, frankly, I think it looks like encampments. That to me, I I think our system of governance, our our economy is generating homelessness and and generating encampments specifically, and and so the problem with that position is like everyone can nod and go yeah yeah yeah, but what like we have an emergency here. This is a crisis. The the federal advocate has said it's a human rights crisis. Just yesterday, she released her report or the day before. So so. Right. So what's the practical? And I, I would just have to agree with so much of what was said. Of course, Esther and I share that human rights framework um, in our work, in our everyday work, as do others on this call. I think um, Tim referenced it and Jamie referenced it as well. So, um, you know, we know what doesn't work. And um, I'm interested in some of these examples that are coming up in the chat because I can I have been to encampments many, many encampments. I might be the person in the world who's been to more encampments than anyone else. I mean, I've been up and down California. I've been across this country. I've seen them internationally in parts of Europe, et cetera. And we know what doesn't work. We Everyone knows. And my, my, my panelists have said, we don't want to replicate the colonial state and the colonial system through our response. That's the biggest thing for me. So when I look at shelters, well, the shelter system, even the most barrier-free shelter system, if it's not designed by Indigenous people, led by Indigenous people, for Indigenous people, it's probably not going to work for the for those people who are homeless and Indigenous. We know that. So shelter system has to be completely revisited. Um, the idea of sanctioned sites and navigation centers, I think Tim put in um, the Texas example, uh, Julieta, my colleague, and I have visited a couple of navigation centers, and they are a nightmare. And uh, the people I met there say, you know, I've been navigated here, but I'm not going anywhere. And, you know, they end up replicating shelters, for example, even where they have some good things, like a place to store your stuff and a refrigerator for your medicines, you know, they mm -hmm. still 
are not producing the kind of results we want. Mm -hmm. uh, we know forced evictions don't work. And by forced eviction, I mean the involuntary removal of people from encampments. Um, and I just want to say one of the things that I've seen that's hugely problematic is you have cities evicting people living in homelessness from the encampments. And then sometimes you have those same cities trying to come up with solutions and work with that population. And that that is like basically like an abusive relationship, right? Uh, slap you one day and give you, you know, candy and love the next. And so if we're, I think what works besides obviously adequate, affordable, sustainable, long-term housing with supports where necessary, which is the housing first approach from Finland and from other places, what really has to happen is a building of trust and building of trust will require an understanding of self-determination. Tim used that term, Esther used that term, I think, maybe Jamie did too. Self-determination is a human rights concept. And I have to say, in a colonial state, it is a very difficult thing for governments to really take on board because it means ceding power. It means allowing the people that you have deemed criminal, trespassers, et cetera. It means deeming them capable of making decisions in their own lives, capable of influencing policy, capable of determining the future. And for governments to cede that, very difficult. I've worked with cities across this country it is one of the big sticking points. How, what does meaningful engagement mean? That's a human rights concept, right? As Stair talked about that. It means being allowing people living in homelessness to affect and change decisions that are going to be made about their lives. Very difficult for governments. I think I'll just pause there. I have tons to say, but I, I want us you know, to, to do what you want us to do, which is have a big conversation. So let's have everybody open up their mics and let's see if we can chat a bit about this. But I, you know, your concept, your, your advocacy for self-determination, my version of that is subsidiarity. The way that looks in Europe and in European structures is that you, you empower local governments to be the accountable entity that's responsible for you, what, whoever's receiving the service, the government closest to them is responsible for delivering and, and co-designing the policy. Mm -hmm. And I think so much of what we're struggling with here is jurisdiction because uh, local governments have this challenge, but housing is traditionally provincially resp responsibility. The federal government has suddenly got involved, but Tim, you live this life. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. It's a whole complicated navigational piece here. And, and actually, mm -hmm. a couple of broadcasts ago, we talked about encampments in many ways, to me, are, for some people, an expression of self-determination. Uh, that they're saying, no, wait a second, I feel safer here. I'm going to make a choice to live in a tent. But the mm -hmm. dilemma we've got is how, how do we enable those kinds of options to, to manifest? And lots of people are putting in the chat examples of what are seem to me fairly modest, smaller scale initiatives. That seems to me to be one tangible tactic is that we try to address this at a hyper-local, more manageable intervention level. Who wants to take that? And Jamie, can we actually, I want to just go back to you, Jamie. Jamie, somebody asked in the chat, why did they, why did they have to go and bulldoze? Why did they have to resort to that? So it goes back to what uh, Leilani just talked about and, it's that relationship with the government, with the way that the cities see their policies, how they feel restricted mm -hmm. by the policies that are in place. Right. And they don't have a lot of flexibility or room to make real decisions that impact human mm -hmm. beings in a good way. And that is the bottom line. And you mean, you they, know, you, they, you mean they don't have the resources or they don't have, or they they're- policies Wait. they have these policies okay. that are written that don't allow them the the latitude to make good decisions for human beings and the right mm -hmm. to life um mm -hmm. in regina they bulldozed it because they had this new funding program come out and one of the organizations had applied and said we can do this if you give us all this money we can take all these people out of this encampment and we can house them in a hotel 
Well, it was mm -hmm. the seediest hotel in Regina. It only had 27 rooms. There was more than more than a quarter of the people were pushed back into the street. But because mm -hmm. they vowed to remove the encampment and house these people, all these people were dispersed that didn't get housing. And the city wasn't going to leave this eyesore sitting there with all of these people's homes. These right. currently right. are people's homes. Right. So can you yeah. imagine if somebody came in and walked in your front door and said, hey, somebody thinks they have a really good idea for you and they're going to take you and they're going to displace you and everything that you have worked really hard to gather up until this point is about to go in the garbage so sounds you got pretty, it sounds pretty familiar huh sounds like a pretty yeah. pretty familiar you know, I wanna, pattern i i, I want to jump in on that uh it, it, and there's one question in the chat too that i, I want to get to i think there's there's two things well, first is like i'm going to be the rude guest there's there's a lot of folks on this call that work in city governments. This is on you. You need to be making better choices, right? You need to be finding some of these other options. You have influence in these discussions. Like the, the advocates report was largely focused on the federal government as part of the function of, of her role and her mandate. But realistically speaking, cities lead in these responses. The city of Edmonton is getting manhandled by the chief of police and the province of Alberta, right? That cities play an essential role. There's a, and so it's kind of We're on talking, you, you but, say, I think, but I think. Tim, when you say city, you mean municipal government. I mean, we have. Municipal I mean, government, yeah. Municipal Alex government. Flynn is so on this. Can, Alex Flynn is on this, on this call. She is a constitutional expert. She knows full well, and Carolyn's tried to tackle this too. How do we actually devolve this responsibility? Because one of the dilemmas well, all of but, you are facing is when you try to hold anybody accountable, they kind of yes. go this. Exactly. Right? You know what? You do it in disaster response. So okay, the response to homelessness idea. is exactly yeah. the same as disaster response. The city's okay. lead, senior government support, there's agreement between all of them on who does what. And the mm -hmm. cities have a system in place to manage it. And it's and a, and a disaster response is focused on housing. Rat, it, it respond to the crisis, keep people safe. Coordinate your response, get people back in the housing as fast as possible. Now, somebody mentioned uh, in the chat a question about, well, what's the what do you do in a disaster for people living in encampments? The same as you do for everybody else. Get them inside, right? Yellowknife was evacuated this summer, right? And Sander could probably speak to this. Folks in Yellowknife that had homes were sent to other places inside. They were sent to hotels. They were given money to go stay with relatives. They were helped out of town. People experiencing homelessness were arrested, put on buses or planes, sent to homeless shelters. But I ran into it. I Tim, ran into yeah. Tim, just just that, like get them inside. I mean, there we already start losing that thing about self determination. Yeah, because no, it's not, that's true. Yeah, it's it's right. a convert. Like I'm not, I'm not saying force them inside, right. but you got to create the same options as yeah. you do for everybody else, right? But also in the pen, like if you look at the pandemic response. It, a lot of mayors have said to me, man, I love that pandemic period, right? Because it's what you said, Tim, right? All the levels of government were working together. We're going to- We were in a we were in a massive disaster response. Yeah. However, racialized communities did not feel that that worked well. Indigenous mm -hmm. communities did not feel that it worked well. Why? Because they weren't properly consulted. And if you look, like Andrew Buzari did a huge amount of work, Dr. Andrew Buzari, who you most many of you will know is a- social medicine doctor and he works with homeless populations and racialized communities. And during the pandemic, he made sure that those communities were reached properly, were consulted, were, you know, all the the um, uh, concerns around vaccination, et cetera, he was addressing with those communities, building trust with them. So I think like this interjurisdictional piece is huge, super important, but what I like to call it is more of like a, Interjurisdictional multi stakeholder approach is what we need, where we're bringing in also indigenous governments, not just the three typical level, you know, orders of government we talk about, but also bringing in people with lived expertise, um, people who are, you know, studying this and, and working on this, like, a, like the Asteras of the world, et cetera, right? So, and, you know, of course, advocates, et cetera. So I don't think just a 
like I think when the federal housing advocate said we need the federal government to do a national plan to address encampments, I think what she meant was uh, use their spending power and their convening power to come up with a plan that's actually going to work for the people living in encampments. And sorry, uh, Jamie, I see you. Jump in, Jamie. Unless... Jamie's put her hand up. She wins. Up you go, Jamie. <laughs> but I think one of the things that everyone is missing is that there's no education piece to this. The discrimination right. Indigenous people face on a daily basis, mm -hmm. on every level we live in our lives, has to be addressed. We have to stop being the topic of discussion, and we have to be part of the discussion. Right. And until we educate mm -hmm. others about why it's not homeless people, and I put that in quotes, or indigenous people, we have to stop labeling each other. We're human beings. And there has to be some education that removes that barrier, that discrimination. You know, I just read a story about a young lady who was um, in a homeless, in an encampment, she was homeless. And she had an opportunity to go back and go to university. And she went to the library every day. She took her classes and she managed and navigated through public washrooms, through the supports that she had, and she remained in the streets for one full year and she committed to her education and she finished it. Why are we not educating the general public that, you know, just because you're homeless doesn't mean you're garbage. Yeah. We have to start opening that conversation up and we have to stop using the word co-development you're not co-developing anything with Indigenous people. You're telling us what you think we need. Yeah. And until you build an allied ship approach, we will never have that trust that was discussed. Unless yeah. we trust you, unless we feel that you are with us, supporting us, respecting us, we will never be seen and the discrimination will never be removed. I cannot take my brown skin off. I cannot hide my brown skin. And every store that I walk into, it's the first thing people see and it's the first thing people think about who I am as a person. They mm. don't care who I am. They just know I'm brown. And that's my always my first step into public. Yeah. You know, I, this it, Sandra, I'm interested about this, what Jamie's getting at here around, and actually all of you have said it in different ways, that, you know, trust is the component. And, and all of our visceral reactions to how this is being coped with is eroding trust. It's so untrusting. You're in the shelter business. How, how are you trying to build trust with, with the people that are the users of your service? How does It must be a huge challenge. It is a huge challenge, uh, particularly when you're dealing with the high volumes of the numbers that we're dealing with. And, um, you know, we've been very successful in terms of like rapid resolution and getting people rehoused quickly, um, you know, return to shelter rates less than 4%. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, but, you know, we've seen a dramatic increase in the numbers uh, this year, uh, over mm -hmm. 26% and new people coming in all the time. And, you know, you've got limited resources and, you know, trust comes down to relationship. Right. Mm -hmm. And being really intentional that one of those one on one conversations that were were mentioned earlier. And we certainly do the best that we can. But do we have the resources that we need to do it appropriately? No, we don't. Uh, um, and, you know, ultimately it, it comes down to working more with the people who are ready to engage because you don't have the, the, the resources to be doing the same thing with everybody all the time, every day. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a terrible situation. It's, uh, you know, it's demoralizing for those we serve and for the staff. And for right. the staff, I'm sure. And we, we've heard, yeah. well, we've heard stories of the trauma on both sides. That's yeah. in all the PTSD that exists within the service workers as well. You know, it's interesting, Tim, when you're saying, you know, hey, city people, or municipal government people, pay attention. The dilemma, and it's being repeated in the chat over here, is, you know, this is the level of government, order of government that has the, the, the least it has the least money and it mm -hmm. has the least capacity to raise money. Toronto just passed a big honking budget, 10% property tax. You know, is that the solution really? I mean, I think property taxes obviously should come up. I'll hear about that. Mm -hmm. But but it's not an, yeah. it's not a, a, a revenue source that grows. And I think yeah. this is the dilemma that we've got is you've got shelter workers working with inadequate supports in the first place. And then you've got a housing system 
that has mm -hmm. not been delivering the diversity of housing choice for several decades. Mm -hmm. So these mm -hmm. are big, heavy structural challenges that people worry about, but it doesn't actually change the experience of that family. As you just mm -hmm. suggested, Jamie, the person who's in a tent in the in the square facing city hall in the city of Halifax mm -hmm. and gets up every morning and goes to their job and then mm -hmm. comes back to their tent. So how well, do we square that? Tim, I think you want to say something. Yeah. And then I'm well, interested to hear from Esther as well, because I know you've yeah. been advocating for these structural you know, uh, fidelity around rights. But in the meantime, what do we do? So the, the one suggestion yeah. has been, let's take a disaster preparedness approach. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I, I would just I would just say that cities aren't powerless. And they're, they're making You're choices- You're talking about municipal governments. When you're you're talking municipal about municipal governments. Yeah, municipal yeah. governments aren't powerless. They're making choices to use police and spend millions chasing homeless people around. They're making choices to go to court to fight uh, lawsuits, those cost millions of dollars, right? They're, they're making choices with the resources. They don't have enough to solve the problem by themselves. But if we get stuck in this mindset that poor old municipal government, we can't do anything, you'll do nothing. Yeah. And you'll just resort to what you have, which is enforcement. Like we need municipal government. So Tim, if you were sitting, creative. if you were sitting at a table with senior municipal officials, mm -hmm. what kinds of advice and practical problem solving tactics would you be encouraging them to pursue within look the at, levers they've yes. got look look at your municipal disaster response structure okay see how you can adapt that okay. work with your community partners in in edmonton for example you could work with homeward trust in ontario the, the municipal governments also administer provincial homelessness uh, dollars right yep. you, you do not have everything you need to solve the problem but you do have enough to get started, you do have enough to address encampments, and you do have the ability to drag the the provinces and the federal government into a conversation. But yeah, no municipal governments can't do it alone. But I don't believe for a second they're powerless. I I don't want to. Um, I think as you you mm -hmm. sort of pointed to a stair, but I just want to say what Tim is saying. I think is quite right in it, from the point of view of human rights as well. All orders of government have an obligation to use the maximum of their available resources to address violations of human rights and ensure people enjoy their human rights. And I do not believe that cities are doing that right now. And Tim gave the example of them investing in police and using police as if it's somehow a solution to any of this and, and not um, looking at their resources. He says, you know, their resources related to um, um, what's the word? Uh, disasters or whatever, but whatever. Leilani, all but Leilani, the resources. But let's go back to trust because the dilemma is, uh, and I heard it this morning with the mayor of Toronto on the CBC talking about how she advocated for this big property tax increase, but she's also giving the police exactly the increase they want. And she got pushed back on that. That's about trust too. We have people in communities that feel afraid and the, the trust erosion has happened across the whole system, right? Yeah, that goes to Jamie's point, right, around education. I okay. don't have so much sympathy for people who are uh, like afraid generally about homeless people, et cetera, because, I mean, first of all, they're being denied, homeless people are being denied a fundamental human right. The, the link between housing and life is clear we we see it all the time right your life expectancy is half if you are unhoused but, so but, but, but listen we, we've now got every dinner table conversation across this country and every public policy table and i'm sure the federal budget is going to be about housing 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 so that piece is getting a lot of attention the piece you guys are talking about i think is more well, and I, I wanted to raise that too because yeah. there is a complete disconnect between that arm of what the government's doing, build, 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 you know, let's let's do housing, 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 and what's happening at the other end of with homelessness. And they are connected. And that's what I meant at the outset when I said we we have a financial economic system that is creating homelessness, and it is very much related to what's happening on that build, build, build side. And yeah. until we start making those connections, yeah, sorry, but we're screwed. I also want to just, I'm going to lob this in. I would like to see the private sector being engaged as co-responsible for some of the, the, the social issues that are arising in this country, including homelessness, because they have contributed to it. And 
and yeah. you know, people know I work on the financialization of housing. There are di di direct connections between what's happening at that end, as I said, and and homelessness. But no so, one wants to have that conversation with the privates. No but, one. But, but but I mean, we're you know, it's uh, here we are. I mean, I'm appreciative that everybody's talking about the biggest issues possible, and I appreciate that because that's what this is a manifestation of. But just if we can get down to the granular here, education uh, said again and again, trust building right across the board, this notion of repurposing disaster prepared. That's a very interesting model to look at. Why can't we do it under a disaster circumstance? And we seem to understand that and there's public support for it, but, but not here, like a natural disaster, disaster. And then this idea of how do we engage the private sector? How do we build more trust and more public support, I would think, um, for these kinds of creative solutions? Um, who else wants to get in? Esther, you want to throw time in? A couple of things. So sure. you know, I think there's a big connection between the role municipalities can take and this financialization and private sector piece because municipalities deal with planning and there are lots of interventions that can be made in the planning sphere to make sure that we're focusing on affordability, that we're focusing on the right to housing. And, you know, the, of course, municipalities do have resource issues, but they also have lots of resources and they, as we've talked about, can choose where to spend them. And they also have expertise in terms of involvement. And we think about involving people in all sorts of planning processes in different ways. So let's turn some resources and expertise to making sure that those kinds of public involvement structures are human rights compliant and that they're engaged in the context of encampment. We can't let a kind of urgency, emergency framework emerge in a non-human rights compliant way. That's my concern about the kind of emergency framework. We see that unrolled in, in ways in which human rights are not respected and we need to be very careful of that in this context when we're dealing with folks whose human rights are being violated constantly every day. So let's you know, think about what urgency means in a human rights compliant way. Yeah, I mean, again, um, you know, lessons from COVID, you know, there were a whole bunch of things that we should be deriving lessons from. And one of them, I think you guys are consistently saying is whatever you do, it has to be human rights compliant. You know, that we had urgent situations. People think you can do all sorts of things. There's good parts of that when you have to act urgently, but there's also potentially lots of violations. So that has to be our takeaway here. It's 2024. We realized we had to completely infiltrate human rights thinking into uh, preventive policies, funding and resources. Okay, yes, go ahead, Jamie. Trying to be polite. <laughs> we, have to, throw in. we have to look at the, the basics of this. Saskatchewan's very cold. We get minus 60 winters. Uh, a, a person is outside in the cold. They're sleeping on the pavement. They freeze to the pavement. They go into emergency. They get an amputation, they don't have a home, they don't have supports, they don't have wraparound services, they don't even have the health care to provide them aftercare services after a major amputation, but then pushed it out into the street into a wheelchair with no supports whatsoever. Now they've been set back even further because mm -hmm. now they have this new disability that they have to navigate. This yeah. is a human being we're talking about, but we yeah. feel that homeless people or people that are marginalized and are facing these crisis situations are less than, not worth it, and they're a problem. We have to start meeting them where they're at, holding their hand, telling them that they matter, telling them that we care, and showing them that we care. Because dumping a person in the streets after a traumatic event event like an amputation is cruel. cruel it's more cruel than anything i've ever seen and when do we get to stop the cruelty on our brothers and sisters and until we really look at that there's no way we're ever going to fix this no matter the policy the money the regulations or the advocacy it has to start with the people you know you each have got 10 seconds to say something but i dare you to try to tap to improve on what jamie just said but let's go around 10 seconds sandra each of you What's the primary thing that you're going to be focusing on? Sandra, then Leilani, then Esther, and then Tim. 10 seconds right. each. It's hard to follow up on Jamie. I'm just going to say uh, I love exactly what you just said. And uh, I'm kind of speechless right now. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Leilani. I'm going to just echo what Jamie just said 100%. What worries me most 
is our current government and the way it's engaging other brown people overseas in the Middle East suggests to me we are a far ways away from solving anything in this country. Esther. I mean, I can't improve on what Jamie has said, but just how do we build out centering that notion of care mm -hmm. and respect and, and mm -hmm. respect for dignity? Last word, Tim. Uh, what Jamie said and politics moves at the speed of public opinion. So if you want to shift that, then we need to engage. In and, and, and maybe the way we affect public opinion is we start to build some trust and some awareness and some education and we start to embed in our policies. You know, I always say that cities are fundamentally an act of collective empathy. We make choices to live close to one another in proximity. And one of the great challenges we have right now is that people aren't coming downtown. They aren't coming into their neighborhood streets. They're not being exposed directly. They're only getting it through intermediated media. And so maybe that's part of what we have to try to do is continue to build back our collective trust in one another to confront and challenge that, as you said, Jamie, our brothers and sisters and what we're all collectively in. Thank you very much for being part of City Talk. There are always such rich conversations. Thanks to everybody in the chat. Lots of great resources, lots of great candor there. We'll see you next time. And thank you to Leilani, Esther, Tim, Jamie, and Sandra. Thank you for joining us in the, in the midst of your day. I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great conversation. Thanks, Mary. Bye.